Hello, everyone. Thank you for joining us today uh, on our topic on lung cancer and their interstitial lung disease, a growing problem, presented by Dr. Shane Shapira. Dr. Shapira is an associate professor in the Faculty of Medicine at the University of Toronto. He is the director of the Interstitial Lung Diseases Program at the Toronto General Hospital, which is part of the University Health Network. He also works with the Toronto Lung Transplant Program, providing pre-lung transplant assessments for patients with interstitial lung disease. Dr. Shapira. Hi, Sharon. Thanks so much for the invitation to talk today. And I'm, I'm, I'm really thrilled to get to talk to you about this topic that I think is, um, you know, definitely a topic that is uh, a bit scary for our patients, um, but I think really important that people learn a bit about this so that they can, uh, you know, be uh, informed and advocate for themselves. Um, here are my disclosures, uh, the various folks that I've been working with over the last couple of years in the pharmaceutical industry. So my, my goal today is to sort of cover four large uh, topics. Uh, what I'd like to do is describe the epidemiology of uh, lung cancer in patients with interstitial lung disease, or ILD. Um, with uh, COVID being active, everyone's kind of becoming a little bit of an epidemiologist, so you'll have an idea of what we're talking about. Um, we're going to talk about some of the diagnostic challenges in the workup of patients with ILD. Um, in particular, uh, I'm going to teach you how we would normally work up someone with lung cancer, and we're going to talk about why some of those tests uh, may not either work or may not be uh, available for our patients with interstitial lung disease. Then we're going to talk about the risks and benefits of the various treatments that exist for uh, lung cancer, so surgery, radiation, and chemotherapy. And each of those is wrought with its own set of very unique risks in the ILD patient. And then finally, I often get asked about lung transplant. Uh, you know, if patients have uh, cancer, they ask if they can get a lung transplant. And we're going to talk about the possibility of lung transplant in highly selected patients with ILD and lung cancer. But uh, you'll hopefully see why that's not usually the path that would be taken. So, you know, the, the biggest problem that we have with lung cancer in the ILD patient is that uh, these patients are excluded from all trials. So whenever you're looking at a study of uh, new patients who are diagnosed with lung cancer, where they're going to do one of these clinical trials and randomize them to some new chemotherapy or new radiation treatment, they all have this list of conditions that would make you not a candidate. Uh, and because of the complicated nature of ILD, these patients are always going to be excluded from trials. And, and that's really tough because what it means is that there's very little of what we call this prospective data about ILD and lung cancer. And so instead, most of today's presentation is going to focus on what we call retrospective studies, where we, we have groups of patients with ILD and cancer who got various treatments, A, B, or C, and then we look back in hindsight and see how they did and compare that to people who didn't have ILD. So I love this comic where uh, he says, okay, let's check your hindsight. And the guy is actually looking away from the, uh, the, the, the eye check board because um, you, know, you can appreciate that that's not really the same as doing a good quality prospective trial, um, but it's the best we've got. So I, I generally find that it's really helpful to anchor our talk around a case. So I am gonna give you a case of a, uh, a somewhat unusual case, but I think it highlights a lot of the key points that we're going to talk about today. This is a 57-year-old woman with uh, scleroderma-associated interstitial lung disease, or scleroderma ILD. She was treated with cyclophosphamide, uh, which uh, for those of you who might know, this is a really aggressive therapy for scleroderma ILD uh, that can work very well in scleroderma, but does have a lot of associated risks. Uh, particularly with cancers being one of the risks, uh, late cancers being one of the risks associated with that treatment. She actually did very well back in 2010 and then was stepped down to another treatment called azathioprine. About 10 years after she had gotten her cyclophosphamide, she came to the ILD clinic and this was what her scan looked like. Um, and she was found to have this growing opacity in the left lower lobe on uh, routine follow-up CT. Um, now, I appreciate that a lot of people in the audience are looking at this picture on the right and having no idea what they're seeing, but I'm going to highlight right here for you inside this red circle, this is the thing that got us worried. 
Um, now, some of you will look at that and say, well, I don't know what that is and why would you be worried by that? And I can tell you, this is one of the challenges that even radiologists or x-ray doctors who are experts in this might look at a scan like this and not appreciate that that thing within the red circle looks different than the other stuff. But a really experienced ILB expert will look at that and say, hey, that thing in the circle actually looks a little different than everything else on your screen. And I'm going to show you how that spidey sense that we developed from looking at these scans all the time uh, led to uh, an early diagnosis of cancer in this patient. So before we go on and talk more about that case, I want to talk a little bit about the epidemiology of lung cancer in, in patients with interstitial lung disease. So lung cancer is common in our patients. And, and that's a really hard thing because, you know, often when I diagnose patients, for example, with IPF or idiopathic pulmonary fibrosis, the first thing that they say to me is, well, it's not cancer, is it? And I say, oh, no, don't worry, it's not cancer. But maybe I don't actually say it like that because you can't say don't worry because IPF is still such a serious and major illness that now we have to deal with for the rest of their lives. But then in a small number of those patients, a visit later, whether it's you know a year later, three years later, five years later, I might come back to them and say, well, you know how your biggest worry when this first came on was that you had lung cancer and you didn't have lung cancer then, but unfortunately you've developed lung cancer now. And that's not actually an uncommon thing in our clinic. About one in five patients with IPF will eventually develop lung cancer. In other diseases like scleroderma, lung cancer is less common than in IPF, but still a very common cancer to diagnose in these patients, occurring in up to 5% of patients. There really isn't much data in any of the other interstitial lung diseases. So it's really these two um, more common ILBs that we have the best data for. But we assume that that risk for cancer applies to all the ILBs. And, and the question here is always, is it the chicken or the egg? Is it that the ILD causes the cancer or is it that the people who get ILD have other risk factors for cancer that put them at risk of both ILD and lung cancer? So some examples of this might be, for example, smoking. So we know that particularly in IPF, many of our patients will have a history of smoking and that is a risk factor for both IPF and a risk factor for cancer on its own. Similarly, if you have emphysema or this CPFE pattern, that stands for combined pulmonary fibrosis and emphysema, we know that that group is particularly at risk for cancer. And again, the question is, is it because of the emphysema and the smoking or is it the ILD itself? Similarly, we know that some environmental exposures that put people at risk of ILD, like asbestos that causes asbestosis or silica that causes silicosis, these things on their own are associated with lung cancer. And even just having an underlying connective tissue disease like scleroderma, lupus, rheumatoid arthritis, we know that those patients are at higher risk of cancers as well, even in the absence of ILD. But there are some reasons to think that it's not just a combination that they happen to have ILD, but they got cancer because they're a smoker. We, we know that there are some commonalities between lung fibrosis and the mechanisms of lung fibrosis that might put you at risk of cancer. And there's a few things that I've listed here that make us think that. So the first is that there's multiple biologic similarities between what's called this epithelial metaplasia. And don't worry too much about what that is, but it's some of the biologic changes that happen in the lung and fibrosis. That epithelial metaplasia looks a lot like something called carcinogenesis, which is the development of carcinomas or cancers. Uh, we also know that it's, it's more than just coincidence that invasive cancers commonly develop in parts of the lungs where they already have fibrosis. There's even a name for this, we call them scar carcinomas because it's a carcinoma or a cancer developing in the areas of scar. You can see on this picture on the right that, you know, 68% of cancers in people with ILD will happen within the zone of fibrosis. So maybe there's something about the actual development of scar tissue that's causing cancer to develop in those areas. And this is not unique to the lungs. So there are other organs where we see the same thing. So for example, we know that people who have liver fibrosis or cirrhosis, whether it's from 
hepatitis B or alcohol, those people who have scarring in the liver are at higher risk of getting liver cancers. And so this concept that maybe scarring within an organ leads to cancers later developing in that organ, that's not unique to the lung. So I think many of us think that it's probably a combination of factors. The scarring itself probably puts you at risk of uh, cancer, but then some of the risk factors that led to the scar formation in the lung probably also uh, contributes to your risk of cancer. So, so that kind of tells you a little bit about the epidemiology, how frequent it is and, and why it happens and how it happens. Now we need to talk a little bit about the diagnostic considerations for someone who has ILD and cancer. So many of you will be familiar with the idea that if someone's worried about a cancer, they want to get some tissue or a pathologic sampling. The other name for this would be to get a biopsy of the part of the body that might have cancer. And, and there's several potential benefits of getting some tissue. Um, first of all, getting a little piece of tissue uh, might help you to prove that the patient has cancer. You know, you see a spot on the lung and, and if you're not sure, the only way to really know if that's cancer is to get a sample or a biopsy of it. The other benefit of getting some tissue or getting a, a biopsy is that over the last few years, we've developed some really interesting targeted therapies for cancer that are specifically targeted at certain genetic mutations that can be in the cancer. And I've just given a couple of examples here. There's something called an EGFR mutation or an ALK mutation or PD-1 mutations. We now know that if you have these mutations in your cancer tissue, that might make you a candidate for very specific targeted therapies that might be more effective. And in people who don't have ILD, there's sort of two ways that you can get tissue to make this diagnosis. One is to use a test called the bronchoscopy, and the other one is to use a test called the CT guided biopsy. So let's just briefly talk about what those are and when you would use them. So a bronchoscopy or a bronchoscopy directed biopsy is where we use this bronchoscope, which is a flexible fiber optic camera, also called a scope, that's about the size of a pencil. And we put it down your trachea or your breathing tube and it goes down into the lungs. You can see that black line going in. And then on the left here, you sort of see what happens once it's in there. It goes down and it gets close to where the tumor might be and can get a sample. This is pretty good for what we call central tumors. So tumors that are sort of near the center of the chest because if that camera is the size of a pencil, you can imagine I can't go down into the airways and get all the way out to the edges of the lung. Right? I can only go as big as the airways will let that camera go. The other way to get a biopsy is called a CT guided biopsy. And in this kind of biopsy, what'll happen is you'll go into the scanner. Many of you will have had CT scans before to work up your ILD. And while you're lying in the scanner, the doctor will put some freezing into the skin and actually put a needle in through the chest wall from the outside. Once the needle is in, they'll do another scan just to make sure that they can see that the needle is right into the spot that they're interested in, and then they can take a sample at that time. And whereas bronchoscopy is really good for the central tumors, the ones that are in the center of your chest, a CT guided biopsy is really good for the tumors that are sort of near the edges of the lungs because the needle doesn't have to go in as far. The problem is, is that both of these tests have risks that are unique to the ILD patient. So for bronchoscopy, as the problem is, is that lung fibrosis usually happens out at the periphery or at the edges of the lung. And so if the tumors usually form within that zone of fibrosis at the edges, it might be too far from the major airways for us to get a good sample. The problem with a CT guided biopsy is that when we put the needle in, there is a uh, risk a temporary risk of something called a pneumothorax, which is like collapsing of the lung. Now that sounds super dramatic and it's not certainly that dramatic, but if you imagine your lung is kind of a balloon filled with air, when you put a needle into it, there's a risk that that needle can cause a little bit of a leak. Nothing pops, there's no like major pops or anything, but you can get a little bit of a slow leak from that hole. Usually that slow leak is very temporary and doesn't cause a lot of problems. 
In fact, sometimes within minutes or hours, the lung will already heal, seal that leak, and you'll get better. But if the lung that we're putting the needle in is very scarred, that part of the lung might have trouble healing. And so that leak may persist, and then uh, we run into other problems. This is not usually a major life-threatening concern, but, but it can be a serious problem for patients. So then the question is, well, do we really have to get a biopsy diagnosis? And, you know, I have patients who come to me and they say, oh, well, they said I had cancer, but they didn't even do a biopsy. And, and they say I have cancer. How can they know? And the truth is that maybe we don't need to do this in everyone, because if you have a patient with ILD who has a spot in the lung that is growing over time, that's almost always going to turn out to be cancer, given what we know about the fact that people with ILD are at a high risk of cancer. So sometimes that might be enough. On top of that, these targetable mutations that I talked about earlier, the EGFR mutations and the ALK mutations, although those can happen in patients with ILD, they're much less common in that group. So usually it's just sort of the straightforward bread and butter cancer. And so, you know, that doesn't mean that we should or should not be getting biopsies in patients with ILD. But what it means is that this is really a case-by-case -case discussion that you would need to have with your doctor, talking about the risks and the benefits of doing a biopsy. But there will be a lot of patients where, where you won't do a biopsy, and the doctors will still be pretty confident that you have lung cancer, and then they can move forward, even though uh, for patients that can be tough because you feel like, well, maybe they're wrong. And, and, and that's fair, but to be honest, we're, we're usually not wrong in this particular scenario. So now that we've talked about how you might make a diagnosis of lung cancer, the next thing is to talk about staging. And I think a lot of people are familiar with the concept that cancer has these stages, you know, but what does that really mean? And so in lung cancer, we talk about four different stages. So the first stage or stage one cancer is when you have a really small isolated tumor. So in this picture on the bottom left and the reference if you wanna see is uh, here on the bottom so you can go online and read this article if you like, it was quite good. Um, this spot on the left, you can see that little yellow dot within the lung and that's the tumor and it's small. It's about one to four centimeters. And so that's a stage one tumor. A stage two tumor is still small but the tumor might be a little bit bigger and now we're starting to see that the tumor has spread, but only spread locally. So within that same area of the lung. And the way that cancers spread is they spread to these things called lymph nodes. That's where the cancers go. Stage three cancer is when the tumor is actually, is, is either quite large or if it's spread to more distant lymph nodes. So now we're not talking about just spreading to a lymph node that's right next to the tumor, but maybe we're starting to talk about spreading to lymph nodes that are on the other side of the chest or in the center of the chest. And stage four lung cancer is what we call metastatic disease. And metastatic disease means that the cancer has spread outside of the lungs to other parts of the body. That might involve spreading to the brain, the bone, the liver, or even to the other lung, because if it's spread all the way to the other lung, we think of that actually as a distant spread, because that didn't happen through direct spread. It had to have traveled in the blood and gotten everywhere before it would lodge in the other lung. So how do we normally decide? And, and I put usually in quotations, because this is not what I'm going to talk about next, is how we stage cancers in people who don't have ILD. And then we'll come back and talk about the special considerations for our patients. So the first thing that we would do is look at the CAT scan. So measuring the size of the tumor is actually really easy on a CT scan. You can see it, you can measure it, and you can decide, is it three centimeters, is it eight centimeters, is it larger? We can also even look at the lymph nodes on a CT scan. We can see those lymph glands and see if they're enlarged. And you know, if you have cancer and you have an enlarged lymph node, in a normal patient without ILD, you would assume that that's from the cancer because why else would you have that big lymph node? 
You can also do something called EBUS. And I know I'm using lots of acronyms, but you know, medicine is sort of filled with these acronyms. So hopefully each one I'm gonna at least explain to you so you can hear what we're talking about. So EBUS stands for endobronchial ultrasound guided biopsy. So this picture on the top right, this is a picture of a bronchoscope. If you remember a few slides ago, I showed you the bronchoscope that goes into the lungs, into the trachea. But this bronchoscope is very different. At the tip of this bronchoscope, you see that little pink thing that's sort of semicircular. So that's actually an ultrasound probe. So the same kind of probe that you might use if you were having an ultrasound when you're pregnant or something like that, but it's very little. And they put it at the end of the bronchoscope and they can actually see past the airways and look into the tissue and see if they can see uh, a tumor or a mass. And then they can, the, the bronchoscope has this little needle that you can see coming out of the camera, going into that little blue dot there in the middle. And that's sampling a lymph node directly. Um, just a little shout out uh, to, uh, you know, some Canadian pride. So this machine called EBUS, uh, this was initially de developed by a Dr. Yasufuku, who actually works here at the Toronto General Hospital in Canada. Uh, so he developed this uh, and EBUS is now actually used uh, essentially around the world in every single patient who develops lung cancer who needs staging. So a real shout out to one of my colleagues who uh, literally changed the world uh, with his invention of EBUS. The next test that we do for our patients is something called a PET scan. So a PET scan stands for positron emission tomography. Uh, and you don't have to remember the long version. You can remember PET scan. You know, we love all these acronyms. They're kind of fun even, you know, we've got CAT scans and now we've got PET scans. We're really animal lovers, I guess, in the medical world. So what is a PET scan? So the premise of a PET scan is that cancer cells are growing faster than the other cells in your body. And these cells, as they're growing fast, they'll use more sugar for energy than the other cells in the body. So some very clever person came up with the idea that if you could figure out some way to see the sugar cells all over your body or the sugar molecules all over your body, you'd be able to see if the cancer had spread to other parts of the body. So what we do is, we have patients drink a small amount of this radioactive sugar. Now that sounds very Chernobyl-like, but it's really not. It's a medical kind of radiation, one that doesn't cause damage to human tissues, but it's the kind of radiation that we can detect with our machine. So this radiation doesn't harm you, but we can see that radiation. And so you drink this sugar that's tagged with radiation, and then a few hours later, we do this PET scan and cancer cells will show up as glowing or as hot on these PET scans. Now, cancer cells are not the only parts of the body using sugar. So other parts of the body, like for example, the heart might also be using a lot of energy and sugar. And so that might also be hot, but we're looking for places that grow hot in a way that you wouldn't expect. So if you look, for example, at this picture on the right, this is a PET scan of someone who's like looking at us. So they're actually standing at us and we're sort of slicing down their center. And you can see in the middle, this white line down the middle, that's the spine of this patient. And what you can see is that this yellow thing at the top on the right, actually the patient's left because they're looking at us like in the mirror, that's glowing hot because that's the cancer. But what you also see is that this spot down here where the white arrow is pointing, that's a spot that's taking up a lot of sugar in the liver. And so what that's saying is like normally the liver should not be using a lot of sugar. And so what it's saying is, hey, there's something using a lot of energy there in the liver. And this is an example of someone where the cancer has actually spread to the liver and it's metastatic disease. So now you know all about staging, you know about CAT scans, you know about uh, uh, PET scans, uh, and you know about EBUS. So how does this apply different to our ILD patients? Well, the problem is, is that lymph node staging is very challenging in our patients using the usual thing. So in patients who have interstitial lung disease, the interstitial lung disease itself might cause the lymph nodes to get enlarged. 
That doesn't mean you have cancer. It's just sort of a reaction to what's going on in the lung. And so enlarged lymph nodes have much lower specificity in patients who have ILD. So what that means is that in a person who doesn't have ILD, if you see an enlarged lymph node, there's about an 84% chance that that lymph node is enlarged because of cancer. So most of the time you can say, oh, you've got cancer, you've got a big lymph node. It's highly likely that that big lymph node is because the cancer has spread to that lymph node. But in the ILD patient, they may have big lymph nodes for other reasons. So we found that if you have a big lymph node and you have ILD in cancer, it's only like a 50-50 or 47% or chance that that big lymph node is from cancer. So it's sort of a toss up. You can't know if that lymph node is from cancer or just from the ILD. That EBUS procedure, we do it a lot and it can be very useful. But if you've got really advanced ILD, you know, that bronchoscopy test where you have to be sedated and you have to kind of be still for 45 minutes while someone goes down into the lungs with a camera and takes that sampling, that might be very challenging to do, and it may not even be safe in some cases. Thankfully, though, PET scans still work really well in our patients. And this is because ILD does not actually use extra sugar. The, the lung fibrosis is not using a lot of energy and sugar. It's just scar tissue. And so it does not light up or get hot on the PET scan. So if you have a spot in the lungs and you do a PET scan and it looks hot, then you know that that spot must be from a cancer, not from the ILD. And similarly, if you notice that the lymph nodes are glowing hot, you know that that's from the cancer, not the ILD, and that can allow you to stage the cancer. The problem is that PET scanners are expensive and they're difficult to operate. And I'm always aware when I give these talks for the Canadian Pulmonary Fibrosis Foundation that, you know, I'm very fortunate. I, I work at the Toronto General Hospital, which is, you know, one of the biggest and most advanced uh, hospitals in the world. We have access to a lot of stuff that may not be available to people who live in other parts of the country. Now, I will say that now in 2021, most cancer centers around the world in major cities and including Canada will have PET scanners but not everywhere. And certainly if, if a patient lives in a place that is more remote, you know, Northern Ontario, Northern Manitoba, it might actually be very challenging to get access to this kind of scanner uh, because they're big and they're difficult to use and, and they're expensive. So they're generally only available in big cities. So let's go back to our case. So now you, you really have become experts now in what we're talking about about cancer, how we diagnose it, how we stage it. So now when I tell you about what we did for this case, it's gonna make a lot more sense, I hope. So this was a 57 year old woman with scleroderma lung disease who had gotten two previous courses of this cyclophosphamide drug 10 years ago. Now she had this growing lung mass in the left lower lobe in July of 2020. Here's her scan. So I referred this patient to what's called our RAMP program. So many places around the country where their lung cancer centers of excellence, they'll have these RAMP type programs. RAMP stands for Rapid Assessment of Malignancies Program. The idea being that we all know that Canada does struggle with some wait times for various tests and procedures and things. But you know, if you're worried that your patient has cancer, you can't wait for six months to get them in to see the specialist. So the governments of many of the provinces have developed these programs that make sure that there's extra resources to get patients in quickly. This patient was seen in the RAMP program and the thoracic surgeons that run that program decided that they didn't want to get a pathologic sample. They did not want to do a biopsy. They thought that her disease was too advanced, that biopsy would be too risky, and they were pretty convinced that it was cancer just from the look of it. So they decided to do a PET scan. And that lesion of interest showed a high sugar uptake. And I'm going to show you what that looks like. So if you look in this green circle, that's the patient's heart on the scan on the bottom left. And you can see how the heart is really lighting up bright, right? Because it's using lots of sugar. And now I want to remind you of that little spot that you might not have thought much of. 
But one of the doctors in my clinic saw that and got worried. And when we did the PET scan, look at what that spot did. It really lights up, right? And whereas before you might've said, well, I can't really tell you know, this from that. I can't tell the ILD from the spot. On the PET scan, you can clearly see that the ILD is all kind of black, but this spot is really hot and red. So that confirmed that this was a cancer. So now we have a patient who's been proven to have cancer. The next question is, what do we do about it? And this is where it gets actually really challenging. So in, again, in order to understand how we would treat patients with ILD and cancer, we have to have an understanding of how we usually treat cancer in patients who don't have ILD so that we can know how it might be different in this group. So these stage one cancers or early stage cancers, in patients who don't have ILD, we would usually do something called a lobectomy, which is where we remove a, a lobe of the lung, or something called a segmentectomy, where we remove a segment of the lung. This has the best chance of, of curing the cancer because you can cut it out completely. The other option is to use radiation treatment. Radiation is not as good as cutting it out with surgery, but it can be pretty effective. And what we would do is we would do radiation therapy for people who couldn't have a part of their lung removed. So for example, if you had very bad emphysema, you may not have enough working lung for us to cut out a whole lobe. So instead we would give you radiation so that you can keep as much of your lung as you can. If you have stage two disease, remember that's where it's a larger tumor that sort of spread to the local lymph nodes, you might still do surgery or you might do a combination of surgery and radiation so that you kind of cut out what you can. And if there's any cancer left in some of those lymph nodes, you radiate them to try and kill anything that's left behind. Stage three cancers are the ones that are really tough because that means it's spread into the middle of the chest uh, into some of those lymph nodes. And so it's harder just to cut it out. And so the chances of curing a stage three cancer are much smaller. And so we basically pull out all the shots and we, we do everything. So we would treat these patients with surgery, radiation, and chemotherapy. Stage four cancer, that's metastatic cancer that spread to other parts of the body. In those patients, there's no real chance of cure. You know, once the cancer has spread in the blood and it's gone all over the body, we may only see, you know, a spot in the lungs, a spot in the bones and a spot in the brain. But realistically, if we're seeing those three areas, chances are there may be many more, maybe dozens or maybe even hundreds of little tumor cells that have gotten in other parts of the body. And so with this, there's no chance of cure. So instead, what we do is we use chemotherapy for the people who have symptoms to try and control the disease. And the hope is, is that the chemotherapy will control it for as long as possible. In our ILD patients, the big debate though is, should we do that stuff? And, and there is this debate about to treat or not to treat in an ILD patient. There is really good evidence that ILD patients get less aggressive cancer care. This is based on multiple registry data. Um, ILD patients with stage one to stage three cancer, where we'd usually use surgery along with other things, our ILD patients are much less likely to get surgery. So only about two thirds of them will get surgery versus 83% of patients who don't have ILD. And in fact, in this one very large registry, they found that, only tw uh, that up to 29% of patients with IPS actually got no therapy for their cancer. So absolutely no treatment. They just said, sorry, you've got cancer. And, and that was it. And I think this is because a lot of doctors take this nihilistic approach. Uh, and, and, and they kind of say like, this is a, uh, a poster from the Walking Dead TV show, but that's something that doctors might think in their heads. You know, They say, oh, well, ILD increases the risk of all the adverse reactions to the treatments I'm going to give. And this patient's probably going to die soon anyways from their lung disease, so they may not want to treat the patient. But I actually think that we should be more like this picture on the bottom right, that we should try and be a bit more aggressive if we can. Uh, 
And that's because untreated lung cancer has a very high mortality. So basically, if you have lung cancer and you don't do anything about it, in an ILD patient, there's about a 50% chance that you're going to die because of the cancer. And so if you're a candidate, in general, it's better to try and treat. But it is important to be aware of this idea that, you know, when I say that 50% of patients with ILD will die from their lung cancer, what that tells you is, is that 50% of patients with ILD and lung cancer will not die from their lung cancer. They'll die from something else, most often their ILD. That's not the same. You know, if I have a 50-year-old gentleman who has no other medical illnesses and he has lung cancer and I don't treat it, he's for sure going to die from lung cancer. So it is important to balance this idea of understanding that the ILD itself is, is a real problem and does affect survival independent of the cancer. So what I'm often asked is to kind of look into my crystal ball and, and the oncology doctors will say to me, okay, well, how likely is this patient going to be to die from their cancer? How likely are they to die from their ILD? And how likely are they? They to get complications if we treat them. And, and this is not easy. There are a lot of scoring systems that have been developed to kind of predict the risk of surgery, radiation, and chemotherapy. Um, but these are very complex uh, and they usually don't do much. So they're difficult to incorporate into your clinical practice. Instead, I use something called a GAP score. I don't know if anyone's familiar with this GAP score, but I actually find it to be super helpful. Um, this was developed by a, a Canadian. Again, I'm always giving a shout out to our amazing Canadian. So Dr. Chris Ryerson, who works uh, in Vancouver, developed something called the GAP score, which is again now used by uh, ILD doctors all over the world. And the goal of this score is that it helps to predict the chances of dying from your ILD. And, and, and this is actually available to anybody. I'll be honest, I'm not entirely sure that I recommend that everybody on this call goes and calculates their GAP score. I know there's a, a, you know, a, 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 this sort of morbid fascination with what's the internet gonna tell me how long I'm gonna live. Um, I will say that even though this score is a good reflection, it's not useful for any one patient, right? And I'm talking about using it in one patient, but we should be cautious. When Chris Ryerson developed this, what he meant to do is use it to develop, you know, averages, you know, so if you have a thousand patients with this age and this lung function, how many of them will be alive at one, two, and three years? And so I caution people of going in, putting in their data and finding out, hey, I've only got, you know, I'm going to, I got a 50% chance of living three years. So, you know, you put a mark on the calendar, like that's not the way the world works, right? But it is helpful particularly if we're trying to predict things in a cancer patient. So as an example, if you go online and you have a, this data, uh, you know, I've got a 76 year old man with lung function that's 42% for one number, uh, the vital capacity and 65% for the other number, the diffusion capacity. These are the two biggest predictors of survival in ILD patients. This will actually spit out that this man independent of his cancer just from his ILD will have a one, two, and three year mortality of 13, 26, and 38%, right? So that's helpful because when we're having discussions about whether or not we should treat this patient for their cancer, well, we should know that untreated stage one cancer of the lung has a 60 to 70% one year mortality. So this is really helpful because I can then go to the oncologist and say, you know, there's only like a 13% chance that this guy is going to die from his ILD in the next year and a 60% chance he's going to die from his lung cancer in the next year. So this is the kind of case where we should probably be more aggressive at treating the cancer. So the next thing I'm going to do is move on to talking about these three different ways that we can treat cancers. surgery radiation and chemotherapy and talk about the, the complexities and the risk that comes with ILD and those three modalities. So the problem with surgery is that the perioperative risks are not small. About 10% of patients who have ILD and lung cancer 
who go ahead and have surgery to try and take out that lung cancer, about 10% of those patients will have something called an acute exacerbation of their ILD, which is a really major and serious problem where the ILD kind of goes out of control all of a sudden. And if you get that acute exacerbation of their ILD, that has a really bad prognosis. About 40% of the patients who get those ILD exacerbations will die from them. So this is no laughing matter. This is serious. And there's a real risk here. There are known risk factors, particularly if you're older or if you have worse lung function, or if your underlying diagnosis is IPF versus other interstitial diseases, those are risk factors. And so because of that risk of an acute exacerbation, we have to balance the risks and benefits of surgery. And this slide is getting a little bit granular. I'm gonna explain what I'm seeing here. If you're with me throughout it, that's fine. If you're not, then I'll kind of give you the, the Coles notes in a moment. But this graph on the right looked at a whole bunch of people who had ILD and lung cancer, and they got all different kinds of surgery. They either got a lobectomy, that's the blue line where you take out a lobe, a segmentectomy, which is where you take out a smaller part of the lung, just a little segment, that's the green line. And then the red line is the people who get a little tiny wedge taken out, almost like you know, cutting off a slice of a pizza, you know, just a little wedge taken out. You try and cut out the cancer and leave as much lung behind as possible. So those are your three options. What the study found was that the bigger the surgery, the higher the risk of these acute exacerbations. So if you had a lobectomy versus a little segmentectomy, the risk of having an acute exacerbation was about 3.8 times higher. But on the other hand, if you do that little wedge resection instead of a big surgery, the chances of a recurrence of the cancer was higher, about three times higher. And if you manage to get the surgery and survive out to one year, that's when you can see that these lines all start to cross each other. And what that, what's happening, what that says is that if you survive a year from your cancer surgery, the people who had the bigger surgery do a lot better. That the, the, the risks that you save by doing a small surgery at the beginning, sure, that gets you through, but then about a year later, the cancer is more likely to come back and you end up in more trouble down the line. And particularly if we look at the five-year survival, if we look at people who have these early stage 1A cancers, so that's really tiny cancers, the people who got the lobectomy had a 69% five-year survival, whereas the people who had that little wedge cut out, they only had a 29% survival. So this is a really complicated scenario, right? You're talking about a lot of competing risks. And I will say that like humans are just not very good at understanding these risks. You know, that's, that's not any one person on their own and there's no blame, but we're just not good at balancing the risk of the surgery to the risk of the lung, the ILD causing you to die compared to the risk of the long-term survival if I manage to get through the surgery. Like these are all these competing risks that we struggle with. And we see this every day, to be honest. I gave a separate talk about a year ago about uh, COVID-19 vaccines and you know, we still see every day people who don't want to get vaccinated because they're worried about the risk of vaccine. Whereas I, I spend every day with those patients talking about how they're misunderstanding the benefits and risks. They're overemphasizing the risk of a COVID-19 vaccine and underestimating the risk of COVID-19 infection. And this is that same thing where people struggle with balancing these competing risks. And even surgeons, and oncologists struggle with it. So, you know, if, if you can get surgery, in general, we would say that that's, that's a good thing to do. But if you're not able to get surgery, you can try using radiation because in patients with emphysema, that's a great alternative, right? It's safer for them. The problem is, is that ILD is also a risk factor for something called really 
or radiation-induced lung injury. So the same way doing surgery can cause these acute exacerbations of the ILD, radiation can also cause acute exacerbations of the ILD. And this was a paper uh, actually done by me and my group uh, in Toronto, and this was the largest uh, analysis of radiation in patients with ILD uh, that was ever performed. Uh, but even that is only 39 patients. So we're looking at really small data. But in that data, you can see that people develop something called pneumonitis, which is the damage to the lung from the radiation. Grade two pneumonitis is when you start to have symptoms of coughing and you can feel it. And you can see that in the ILD patients, 20% of them got grade two pneumonitis. Whereas in the patients who didn't have ILD, it was only about 6%. So already even the mild lung injury from radiation where you get coughing and you maybe don't feel so great, that's more common in ILD patients. But if we look at more severe pneumonitis, so grade three pneumonitis is where you're gonna get damage from the radiation that's bad enough that you probably need to come into hospital. And that happened in 10% of our ILD patients and only 1% of the non-ILD patients. And if we look all the way down to people who die because of the radiation, in our ILD patients, we had two patients or 5% who actually died as a direct complication of the radiation. Whereas in the non-ILD patients, dying from radiation is extremely unusual. So only one out of the 500 patients without ILD died. So 0.2%. Uh, so that's a real problem. Even if you're asymptomatic, even if you have really mild ILD, that still increases the risk of, of radiation-induced injury, where we see that even a third of patients who have no symptoms from their ILD will get radiation damage to the lungs versus 13% of patients who don't have ILD. So a real risk. But I will tell you that the risk seems to be higher from surgery. And if you look at the numbers that I sort of quoted, uh, the, 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 the chances of dying from surgery for your lung cancer if you have ILD is higher than the risk of dying from the radiation. And so many of us uh, believe that radiation might still be beneficial if we could give it. It's better than nothing. But there's been no prospective studies to look at this, uh, but studies are desperately needed. Um, in fact, we're trying to answer that question. So there's a study called the Aspire ILD trial. Uh, this is being done with me and a couple of my colleagues, Dr. Ryerson, who you've heard me mention before in, in Vancouver and, and the group in London. And we're doing this phase two trial of radiation in ILD patients with early cancer. And what we're doing, and this may be a little bit too small to read, but you don't have to read everything here. Basically what we're doing is we're taking patients with fibrotic interstitial lung disease and we're stratifying them by this thing called the gap index. You've heard me now mention this gap index where it helps us just uh, decide how severe your lung disease is. And we're breaking them up into low gap, medium gap, and high gap scores. And then we're giving them all radiation and trying to follow up to see if we can maybe find some threshold. Maybe people with a low gap score can still get radiation safely. And so that study is ongoing and it'll be a couple of years before we have some answers, but we're trying to get those answers. So now let's go back to our case. This is a 57 year old woman. If you remember, she had scleroderma lung disease. She had this growing mass in her left lower lobe in July of 2020. Her PET scan had shown uptake in the nodule, but no evidence of metastatic disease. So I actually referred her to this Aspire uh, radiation therapy study that I'm doing. This is what's called her radiation planning scan. So we do a scan where we plan out where the radiation is going to go. And you can see that we're trying to target all the radiation to that little spot there uh, right here where my arrow is. We're trying to make the radiation so that it hits this part the most and gives the rest of the body as little radiation as possible. This is how we plan out the radiation. What about giving chemotherapy for our patients? Well, you're noticing a common theme. The therapies that we use for lung cancer 
are not well tolerated by patients with interstitial lung disease. And we know that ILD patients are at risk of a chemotherapy-induced pneumonitis or damage to the lungs or these acute exacerbations of ILD. If we look at the chances of getting inflammation in the lungs from chemotherapy, that happens in about 20 to 30% of ILD patients who get chemotherapy, but only 5% in people who don't have ILDs. So the risk is about 5.4 times higher. And this seems to be higher in IPF than other diseases. Having said that, there does seem to be some chemotherapies that are at higher risk than others. So of course, I don't expect this audience to really know what or ask for what chemo you're going to want. But some drugs that we use like docetaxel and atopicide, they seem to cause lung inflammation in as many as a quarter of patients. But other drugs like cisplatin or premetrexid or paclitaxel, those drugs may be lower risk based on retrospective studies. One thing that I often get asked is, well, what do you do with your existing drugs if you have ILD and you're discovered to have lung cancer? Particularly, this comes up in our patients who have IPF because they will sometimes be on a drug called nintedidib. And I have heard some patients and doctors say that, oh, they want to stop their nintedidib while they deal with the cancer. Uh, nintedidib is an antifibrotic drug that we use in IPF to slow the speed that the scar tissue grows. So it slows the progression of IPF. But interestingly, there are some, and there is another drug called perfenidone that also is used to treat IPF, but I don't have much data on perfenidone and lung cancer. So I'm only going to present data on nintenitib because that's really where the data is. This nintenitib is in a class called tyrosine kinase inhibitors, and it affects something called the VEGF pathway. Interestingly, tyrosine kinase inhibitors can sometimes be used to treat cancer separate from ILD. And so there was a study called the Loom Lung 1 study. This was a phase three study of chemotherapy with or without nintenitib in patients who had lung cancer, but no ILD. This is purely just using nintenitib as an anti-cancer drug. And nintenitib actually led to an improvement in survival in that study. So completely separate from the ILD, nintenitib may actually have a role in treating cancer. Um, and it's uh, available uh, around the world to treat cancer on its own. And it's marketed as a drug called Vartigev. So it's the same drug as the OFEV that people may be more familiar with for treating their IPF, but they market it as a different name for this different indication to treat cancer. I think this is very interesting. I don't know if that means that people on intentive are less likely to get cancer or if they're going to do better if they get cancer. But what it tells me is that if you are on intentive and you get diagnosed with cancer, you probably shouldn't stop that drug because it probably will help both with the IPF, but also might have a role in treating the cancer at the same time. So in the last couple of minutes, I'm just going to talk a little bit about lung transplantation. So the Toronto group, which is, is actually the largest lung, or at least one of the largest lung transplant programs in the world, we looked at the incidence of lung cancer in what's called our explant. So what this means is we took people who had lung transplant and we looked at the lungs that we had taken out of them, like the old damaged lungs that needed the transplant. And once we had those lungs out of the person's body, knowing that they had new lungs in there, we then carefully looked at those explant lungs that we took out to look for cancer. And what we found was that about 1.6% of these lungs actually had cancer in there that we didn't even know existed. So we didn't know beforehand. Not surprisingly, the patients who had ILD and that was the reason they got transplanted, had a higher rate of malignancy or cancer. So their rate was 2.8%. So what that means is, for example, if you got transplanted for emphysema or COPD, your risk of having lung cancer in that lung we took out is lower than the people who had ILD. So the, the emphysema patients get less cancers, and that's 
keeping with what we showed before at the beginning where I said that ILD is a real risk factor for cancer. Then we looked at, well, what happened to those people when we did transplants and we cut out those cancers? And the answer was really disappointing. It, those patients actually did very poorly. More than two thirds of those patients ended up dying because of cancer progression. So what we mean here is you can imagine someone who has bad ILB, needs a lung transplant. We don't know that they have cancer, but we do the transplant and they turn out to have cancer we didn't know about in the lungs that we took out. The first thought would be, oh, well, maybe we cured them by taking out the cancer, but that's not the case. In about two thirds of patients, the cancer was actually somewhere else that we didn't know, and it ended up growing after we, gave, uh, we did the transplant. But the people who had really early stage disease, like the kind of disease that we thought we could cure with surgery, that was much less common. Only four patients had that. But of those four patients, only a quarter of them developed recurrent disease. And their three-year survival was 50%, which is pretty good. So in general, what do we say about lung transplant? Well, the presence of active cancer is really, in general, it's an absolute contraindication for lung transplant. And that's because the drugs you'd need to take after a transplant, these anti-rejection drugs, they actually increase the risk that a cancer, if it's present, will grow. So if you talk to almost any lung transplant doctor around the world, and you say, oh, well, I've got lung cancer, can you do a transplant? They'll say, no way, you don't want a transplant because we'll actually make you worse. The cancer might be left behind and then our drugs will make the cancer grow faster. However, some of the more cutting edge lung transplant programs are starting to wonder if maybe we could consider lung transplant in very selected patients. And you need to meet all three of these criteria. You need to have very severe ILD. So you basically need to qualify for a lung transplant separate from the cancer, like that you've got such bad lung disease that you really need a lung transplant just from your ILD. You need to otherwise be an acceptable candidate for transplant. So you can't have bad heart disease or some of the other diseases that might make you not a transplant candidate. And you have to have early stage cancer that's received some sort of treatment that had what we call curative intent. So the idea is either your surgery or your radiation was given with the idea that we think that we've cured the cancer. And so if you meet all three of these criteria, there are some lung transplant programs around the world who might consider you for transplant. And that's sort of why I presented this interesting case, uh, because this is an unusual case, but I think it highlights so many of the things that I've talked about today. So if you remember, this was a 57-year-old woman with scleroderma and a left lung mass. The decision was made to forego pathologic assessment, so we did not get a biopsy. We just said it's probably cancer. We went on to do a PET scan that showed that the lesion was hot, and that proved that it was a lung cancer, but it also proved that it was early disease. She didn't have any lymph nodes that were lighting up or hot. We enrolled her in the Aspire ILB trial where she was given radiation as part of that clinical trial to see if radiation could be done safely. That happened in December of 2020. She underwent an urgent lung transplant assessment a month later once we thought that her cancer had been treated. And this patient actually did receive a double lung transplant in June of 2021. This is a pretty unusual case but I think it kind of ends the story on an optimistic note uh, because this patient really got aggressive cancer treatment with all the stuff that we have in our arsenal. So I'm at the one hour mark. And so what I'm gonna do now is briefly summarize and then I'm gonna open up to questions. So as far as epidemiology, remember that patients with ILD are at an increased risk of getting lung cancer. But despite the poor prognosis of ILD, which is a really serious disease, most patients who have ILD and cancer will actually die from the cancer rather than the ILD. And so the, the cancer is a really big deal in that group. When we're talking about the diagnostic workup, many of our tests are not 
available to these patients. But PET scanning can be an effective modality to diagnose and stage these patients. The problem is, is that PET scans may not be readily available to everybody all over the country, and that's a major concern. When we talk about surgery, a lobectomy where we cut out the whole lobe can lead to local control, and if you get through it, it can actually have very good outcomes. But that surgery can be associated with a high perioperative risk where you can have problems during the surgery itself that can even be life-threatening. And the story of radiation is very similar. Radiation might be effective, but there's clearly an increased risk of this really or radiation-induced lung injury. And studies are needed to further characterize that risk. And so the ASPIRE trial is trying to answer that question. Chemotherapy is also in, uh, ad, uh, associated with an increased risk of pneumonitis in our ILD patients, but in some patients, it can help to improve or control stage four disease for uh, some amount of time in symptomatic patients. And so if you have an expert oncologist who knows what chemo is safe and what is less safe, they may be able to find a treatment that can be tolerated. And then finally, lung transplant is generally not an option for anyone who has any kind of cancer, but it may be an option at certain centers for a highly selected group of patients with early disease. So I'm gonna wrap there and I'm just gonna say a huge thank you to all the folks in my ILD clinic that uh, make it possible for, do, for me to do the great work that I do. Uh, some of them you will actually see this month giving talks. I know Dr. Binney actually just gave a talk yesterday for the uh, Canadian Pulmonary Fibrosis Foundation. And um, this is a, a huge shout out to all the amazing people who I work with who make my work possible. Uh, and I'm gonna stop there and, and open it up for questions. Thank you very much, Dr. Shapira. Uh, certainly, we learned a lot. I know I have. I guess uh, one of the first questions that we have is, um, you know, you talked about this, but I don't know if you can develop, you know, dive into it a little bit more is why is there such a link and a risk for people with ILD and lung cancer? Yeah, so I, I think I, I mentioned it a little bit early, but I'm happy to kind of go over it again, because I think it's, it's really important. I think there's two answers. The first answer is, is that the things that we know cause ILD also cause cancer. So we know that smoking puts you at risk of getting lung cancer. Everybody knows that. But smoking also puts you at risk of getting ILD. And we know that connective tissue diseases like rheumatoid arthritis and, um, and scleroderma, those put you at risk of getting ILD. But separately, people with scleroderma are at an increased risk of getting all kinds of cancers, not just lung cancer. So one part is that there are similar risk factors. And then the second part is that I think that the actual mechanism of developing scar tissue in the lungs causes changes that can kind of just go out of whack. And as your body's making scar tissue in the lungs, it can get confused and some of the cells can start to take on a life of their own and become cancerous. So I think it's a little bit of A and a little bit of B. Okay. So Dr. Shapiro, someone wanted to know, you know, if they don't live close to a, a center of excellence like your center and they live out further in the remote areas and, you know, they're being looked after by a community respirologist and they have ILD and, you know, IPF or PF, um, do they regularly, would they check your lungs to see if you have cancer? Or is that something you as a patient, you know, need to advocate? So that's a fantastic question. And the answer is that it doesn't have to be an ILD center or a, uh, or a community respirologist. The, the unknowns here are the same for everybody. We know that our patients are at higher risk of cancer, but nobody really knows how we're supposed to screen for that. You know, there's lots of evidence to say that, for example, mammograms are really helpful for screening for breast cancer, right? And so uh, most women in Canada over the age of 40 should be considering whether or not they need to get a mammogram every year. But we don't know what this place is for screening for lung cancer and ILD patients, because there are other ways to screen for cancer and other diseases that are not effective. So for example, screening for prostate cancer with this blood test called the PSA is, is not effective. And so we don't know where that balance is in the ILD group. 
Um, Dr. Fisher, who works in the Toronto program with me, um, recently wrote a set of guidelines for Canadian uh, lung doctors treating patients with ILD. And we very specifically said in that document that we think that there is a role for some kind of screening, but no one knows what that looks like. Uh, no one knows if that means you should be getting a CAT scan of your lungs every year, every two years, every three years, every five years. We just don't know. So in general, our clinic will do a scan on our patients about every two to four years, even if they feel good to screen for cancer. So a take home message for this audience might be, you know, don't go to your uh, community respirologist and ask to do CAT scans every six months. But a take home might be that when you're seeing your doctor, you may wanna say, hey, you haven't done a scan of my lungs in two to four years. Do you think it's time to do another one? And, and, and doing intermittent scans may be a good way to find these tumors. Okay. Um, someone also wanted to know, you know, how do you combat this nihilistic view that some physicians might have in their brain and you maybe suspect that on your own like how do you how do you combat that because you know they think well you're going to die anyways right so what's a big deal yeah I mean I think that combating that kind of uh attitude is is one of the things that we've dealt with in IPF forever you know even when we don't talk about lung cancer we just talk about ILD you know there are lots of doctors who have the attitude of well well there's nothing you can do and so don't bother with it and so I think that we fight that on many fronts um, I don't obviously have a magic answer but I'll tell you that a lot of what we do is advocacy and education so as an example um, I recently gave a talk on this topic uh, at the Ontario Thoracic Society uh, annual meeting. Um, I'm giving a talk across Canada for what's called the ILD masterclass sessions uh, in about six or eight months. So I think the answer is I just keep on going and hitting my feet to the pavement and getting the word out that people should do it. And, and I'm not alone. Uh, many of the ILD experts across the country are advocating uh, to our community doctors that they should uh, be aware and, and, and try and advocate for our patients. And, and you can advocate for yourself. Okay. And so someone wanted to know if, if they're on perfenidone and then they find out that they have a cancer, maybe stage one, should they change their medication to nitididum as you had shown in your study? Like, is that something they should push for and advocate and say, look, you know, who, nobody really knows, but it might help my cancer? Yeah, that's a great question. I will tell you that uh, the answer is we really don't know. And I will tell you that in general, I do not make that change. You know, there's this classic saying that the absence of evidence is not the same as the evidence of absence. So, you know, what that means is that even though we don't have any direct data that perfenidone treats or, or helps with cancer, there's no particular reason to think that these drugs are very different. Um, you know, they both stop, they both work in very different ways. And so um, the, sorry, they work in very similar ways, not different ways. They, they work and, same, and do the same thing. They both stop the fibrosis, they slow the progression. Many of us believe that what one drug does, does probably also applies to the other drug. So in general, what I say to my patients is not that this means, oh, everyone with lung cancer should be on intentative. Instead, what it means is if you get cancer, don't forget that you need to keep treating your ILD. And so stay on whatever you're on. And if it's working for your ILD, it may also be working for your cancer. Okay. And um, I guess uh, there's another patient I, I can relate to this. Um, my own father at age 89 had a small cancerous tumor in his left lung. And because of his age, he couldn't get surgery, you know, all the options and everything. And so we did it targeted, direct targeted radiation. And because of that, his lung has started to fibrosing a little bit. And, um, and so this patient wants to know, given that they're a younger age, you know, is it, better just to go get the surgery versus the radiation because radiation might cause a fibrosing if they don't have ILD like what what's your thought yeah so radiation fibrosis or the another other name that i used in my talk was really this radiation induced lung injury is very common from radiation um, it's important to realize that 
the radiation injury to the lung in, in patients is not the same as IPF. Whereas most of the diseases we deal with are what we call progressive fibrotic lung diseases, where you get scarring and that scarring is progressive. It gets worse and worse and worse over time. The radiation lung injury is not really a progressive condition. You get the injury, you get damage to the lungs, and in the first six months, you have some problems. And then after about six months, it's burned out, and that should not get worse over time. So the fibrosis that you get from radiation is very different than IPF, and we shouldn't really necessarily be worried about that radiation being progressive on top of the IPF being progressive. But we should worry about the upfront risks of the two things. And I, I think it's it's, it's not a straightforward answer, but I think the real answer is that we should not be dogmatic. We shouldn't just say, oh, everyone should get surgery or everyone should get radiation or everyone should get nothing. I think it's really a very case-by-case -case answer for each patient looking at their lungs, their tumor, their fibrosis, their wishes, and their philosophy of care. And they get to decide, along with the oncologist, what fits best with them, whether or not they want to do surgery, radiation, chemo, or nothing. And, and I think that that's really got to be case by case. Okay. Uh, we have someone online who wanted to, to say, how do you combat ageism, you know, when you're being treated? How do you combat that um, sort of thought, well, you might be too old or, you know? Yeah. So I think there's two ways to combat ageism. The first way is advocacy. You know, the first way is to be your own advocate. And that's really what the CPFF tries to help people to do, right? And, and I've now given many of these uh, lectures and seminars that are now online, and I've seen some of the ones that are online, and they are just an enormous treasure trove of information. And the CPFF uh, deserves so much congratulations for getting these speakers to give talks like this and to put it in a repository online. Because by watching those videos, by learning about your disease, by learning about the treatments and, and what the options are, you can become an advocate for yourself. And so that's the most important thing is educate yourself, use reputable sources, don't just type stuff into Google. Uh, you know, that's not a good way to get information, but get it from reliable places like the CPFF and, and, and from sources like ILD experts, like the people in my clinic and giving these talks. So that's number one. Number two is, be young at heart. You know, when we talk about ageism, I will tell you that most doctors are not actually looking at your age on the piece of paper. What they're looking at is your biological age, which is something that doctors use to say like, you know, I have some 50 year olds who look and act more like a 90 year old who, and I have some 90 year olds who look and act like 40 year olds. So when we talk about ageism, it may be appropriate that a 95-year-old person who can barely get out of bed probably shouldn't get aggressive cancer treatment. So the way that you can combat the physician ageism is by maintaining your overall health, being active, fit, getting out, exercising every day. And when you talk to your doctors about things, tell them how hard you're working and how active you are. And then suddenly in their mind, you may be 85, but if you tell them that you go for you know, long walks every day, even if it's slow, because you can't run when you've got lung fibrosis, but you're out there pushing that envelope, the doctor in their head will start to think of you as biologically younger than your uh, chronologic age. Um, so those are my two re recommendations. Dr. Schubert, you mentioned in your talk today about the COVID vaccination. Someone wanted to know, um, because they have ILD, you know, IPF, and, and they might have cancer, um, you know, the, the U.S. are going to go and do a booster shot do you think Canada is going to do that for um, this community, given their respiratory ailments and their disease? Yeah, so the, the answer is uh, we really don't know. Uh, and there's a couple of things that we don't know. I think it's important to tease out what we don't know. What we don't know is, does the vaccine actually lose its effectiveness? for severe disease. So it does seem to be true that six to eight months after you've gotten your vaccine, you may be more likely to get COVID, but it seems like those generally, even in people who have underlying lung disease, generally those are still mild cases. So, you know, 
I don't want to comment on specific pharmaceutical companies and studies that they've shown that show that antibody levels go down over time. I'm not convinced I really care about that. I don't care about what a blood test shows. What I care about is how do my patients feel? How do they do? How do they cope? Right? So if it's true that even after those antibody levels start to go down, people continue to be very protected from severe COVID infection, then maybe third doses aren't required. And it's a highly controversial thing about whether or not it's best to give people a third dose or whether it's better to send those third doses to places like Africa so that we can control the virus there and reduce the chances of the next variant, whatever it's going to be called, that will evade the vaccine. So that's the first question is, do we really need a third dose? And then the second question is, you know, is the government going to pay for those third doses? And right now they are not doing that. Uh, NACI, you may now all be familiar with this concept of NACI. They're the ones who make recommendations for uh, vaccines in Canada. They recently came out and said that people on immune suppressing drugs like prednisone, mycophenolate, azathioprine, um, rituximab, those people should be getting a third dose because they may not have mounted a good response to their first two. Um, right now, the government is not paying for a lot of those patients to get third doses, but it'll probably come in the next few months. I think that we really need to wait for more data before we decide if everyone should get a third dose. I want to be really clear, though. I do not think there's any risk from a third dose. So if you're offered a third dose, you go ahead and get it. But I think that big people who are making really important decisions, like uh, the Canadian Minister of Health, has to decide, hey, is it better for us to use those third doses on our patients or to send them elsewhere? Uh, and that, I think, is what we don't know the answer to. Okay. Someone wanted to know, because of your presentation, how you were saying that sometimes if you have ILD and you have cancer, um, that you're not, might be not a good candidate uh, for a lung transplant. How can you overcome that obstacle if you believe in your heart and mind and soul that you are? How can you push that line to say, look, you might not think so, but I think so? Yeah, that's, that's, that's a really good question and a really big challenge because transplant is this really unique medical treatment, right? All the other treatments that we talk about, you know, should you get antifibrotic therapy for your lung disease? You know, there's this nihilism, but the truth is very few doctors are going to withhold treatments. If you go to a doctor and you say, hey, I've educated myself on, let's say, IPF, and I know that these drugs exist and I want these drugs, very few doctors are going to say, no, you can't have it because, you know, these drugs work. And if you're advocating for yourself, we can give it. The difference with transplant, though, is we don't have an endless supply of organs. And so the problem becomes that if I have, you know, let's say I have 100 lungs that I can transplant and I've got 300 patients who need those lungs, now the balance for the doctors are very different. I now have to try and pick who do I think is the most likely to get those lungs and thrive with them because if I give those lungs to someone who, who dies with the lungs because of a complication, then I've actually killed two people. I killed the person who got the lungs who didn't survive, and I've also killed the other person who didn't get the transplant because the lungs went to someone else. So this is very challenging, and I will say that this is one of the unique situations where advocacy will only get you so far. When push comes to shove, the lung transplant centers have the authority to make the final call. You can talk to them, you can advocate. I've seen patients who've managed to get on the list when we didn't think that they would at the beginning, but they really advocated and they were able to convince people. But to a large extent, if you get turned down from a lung transplant program, there is no official mechanism where you can appeal that decision. The doctors in Canada have that right to say, it's not that I don't think you deserve a lung transplant, it's just that I think that there are other people who need it more than you who will have, be more likely to have a good outcome, and, and that's the end of it. Okay, well, thank you very much, Dr. Shapiro. This has been a really great session as always. You give such clear um, you know, perspectives, and um, it's really helpful to all of us in this community to hear an advocate like yourself that uh, you know, the squeaky wheel does get um, you know, the job done. And so we take that as a, as a positive. So thank you very much.
Absolutely. It was my pleasure. And thank you so much for both inviting me and for putting on this amazing series of lectures for uh, patients with ILB in Canada. I really appreciate the efforts of the CPFF. Really great. Thank you very much. Take care.